everybody. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Rebecca Griffith, the EDDPT, and you are listening to the Admitted or Not podcast. And I am so excited to have with me today, Dr. Kyle Strickland. Kyle, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle. I am a doctor of physical therapy practicing at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in uh, downtown Chicago, Illinois. I, I got my DPT at the University of Iowa. I spent a couple of years out at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts as an acute care therapist uh, for about two, two and a half years. Uh, our rotations there were about six months in duration uh, between wow. different major service lines. So we spent, spent time in trauma, ortho, transplant, cardiac, vascular, neurology, kind of the full hospital, which gave me a tremendous background uh, and just how the hospital works and how different service lines uh, practice uh, in terms of different pathologies, working with different surgeons, uh, a great way to just experience a lot of different uh, interdisciplinary teams in a short period of time. Uh, that allowed me to get a little bit of my feet wet in observation and ED care as well. Uh, so at BI, we did not have a full-time ED mm. practitioner, but some of our uh, medicine coverage was on some smaller units. So we'd usually cover uh, any same day consults that came in. And I was always kind of drawn to that area because of the uh, unknown and kind of using our doctoring skills to try to help the team figure out uh, interesting cases, whether it was just, you know, is this person safe to discharge or can you help us maybe diagnose a pathology and, and move forward with that? So really enjoyed that. Uh, but life took me back to Chicago. Uh, and I've been here at Northwestern for a little over seven years now, and about five plus of those have been uh, predominantly in our emergency department, mm -hmm. which has been fantastic. Uh, we kind of started the same too as a uh, page only consult, uh, but as the team started to see our skill set downstairs, we were uh, allotted a little bit more extra time and some piloting piloting six months to a year programs, uh, seeing what it's like to have a full-time uh, practitioner, which went very well. Uh, and it's kind of led to where we're at now with uh, now two full-time PTs in the ED and our OBS units. Uh, we are also currently doing some large randomized control studies on acute low back pain and vestibular uh, evaluation through the help of uh, Dr. Howard Kim, uh, who's an ED attending uh, so that's been a fantastic, fantastic uh, ongoing project that's really expanded what we're able to do and allowed us to, to be in this position. So uh, my work is actually funded through the study, uh, which gives us you know, even more freedom uh, to practice and do different education to the ED providers, our rehab staff, uh, and just allowed us to, to kind of thrive in our ER, which has been fantastic. So we are currently uh, covering about a Monday through Friday schedule at our, our facility uh, from uh, about 7.30 to about 4 p.m. Uh, and we're kind of still trying to figure out evenings and things like that. But uh, What do you do on the weekend? Our, so our weekend, we do have an on-call pager. Mm. Uh, it's, in my opinion, our, our coverage is more a challenge of getting – our teams to acknowledge that there are people they can call whenever uh, I've been trying to break down these barriers of call Kyle and said, Hey, call the PT or call right. the team. Uh, because it's, it's so much of us being down there for this length of time that we are synonymous with physical therapy. And it's sometimes hard for other providers to, to think about us if they know that I'm not working on the weekend, but our, our weekend staff does cover uh, a pager, but I think it's just so infrequently utilized. And our ER team now has a little bit greater capability to board people in our observation unit. So I think mm -hmm. that they will tend to move that route. Uh, so we're always kind of battling efficiencies and getting ED beds and understanding that us to see people like immediately on a weekend when we have four or five people covering a large institution is a little bit challenging, but uh, I think future definitely huge, huge capabilities of, of helping out in that regard. 
Yeah, I think one of the things that people don't realize is the, the emergency department really it, it's a 24 hour gig mm-hmm. and if physical therapists are only there for part of that are we really as integrated as we'd like to be and i think to some extent like nobody wants to do physical therapy in the middle of the night especially the physical therapist um yeah. but i do think like weekends holidays like it's it's somewhere we have to be we have to be able to provide that service yeah no doubt and i think that was our challenge even within our regular staff when i am not available or if I do take a vacation or have a day off, you know, we You're have not people on that, vacation. Yeah, we're, we have people that have uh, definitely interest in being down there, but being down there in terms of the consistency and uh, expanded hours are uh, a little bit of a challenge to, to hire into, mm-hmm. uh, but something that we're kind of always looking to do. And obviously there's places around the country that are doing it very successfully. Uh, and a lot of our staff in the past has been pulled from our, our acute care, which has a very kind of set standard hours. And that's sometimes a draw of having that consistency, which the ED doesn't provide. So true. You you mentioned Dr. Kim, he is actually going to be on the podcast in November. So it'll be interesting to see his perspective, but I'd like to also, he was a resident where I work. So it's kind of cool that he's, uh, he's so such a big champion of physical therapy, but tell me like, what is that like doing research on that large of a scale while you are also providing patient care? How does it change your day-to-day? Yeah, it, it definitely it makes a big difference. Uh, I have to come from it from the standpoint that, you know, right now my, my position's funded by the research. So uh, I do kind of have to lay down some barriers with other team members. Like if I'm getting consulted mm-hmm. for you know, coming at five patients in the morning, I'm going to try to prioritize our research patients, obviously, because uh, that's where, where I should be. Uh, and that's also been very nice too. Our, our staff has been fantastic to help cover. Uh, we're never turning patients away uh, that, that have the need. We just maybe prioritize them a little bit differently and just have to give the team a heads up. Hey, I will be there, but it might be, you know, in 45 minutes to an hour and, Again, our, our interdisciplinary staff and our physicians and residents are so fantastic. And knowing that we are a one to two person show, uh, that they, they understand completely. Uh, but yeah, but being research focused, we kind of have to, to focus on those patients first, just because we've ran into a, a significant challenge of just recruiting patients in the ER. Uh, you think about a, a patient that's been in the waiting room for six to seven hours, with low back pain, they finally get roomed, they finally get seen by a physician, they're seen by us. And now we're trying to keep them and tie them in even longer to, to do some questionnaires and follow up and all this. Mm. You know, sometimes we're meeting people at wit's end, and we have to kind of do a little bit of, of salesmanship to to keep them involved and let them know how important this research is to to help care in the future for patients like themselves. Uh, but that is, that is a challenge and our, our study is unique enough currently where, you know, people who have more chronic than acute pain are, are kind of falling out of the study uh, mm-hmm. for our main part. But uh, that becomes a challenge too of, you know, when we don't have the perfect patient all the time, if they do come and we don't want to miss them by, by being tied up with other constraints. Uh, so kind of keeping that focus first but still obviously uh, getting to our other patients as we need to. Well, and I think that this research is really important because when people ask me what I do in the emergency department, one of the examples that I give is is low back pain. It's such a huge reason that people come to the emergency department that I joke that like we could exclusively see low back pain and do absolutely nothing else and still have enough business for a physical therapist to work full time. So what's yeah. your sense of like the impact that we can make with this particular diagnosis? Yeah, I think it's huge. Uh, if you think about the traditional model of somebody coming in, you know, the doctors might uh, medicate uh, depending on what their symptomology is. Do they need any advanced imaging? Most of the time, very unlikely. Uh, so that patient might be medicated once. And if they're feeling slightly better, they might be told, to, you know, leave the hospital and follow up with an outpatient PT or something like that, or they might not really have the knowledge of what we do, uh, or the knowledge of 
kind of what are some simple things we can do currently and, and moving forward to kind of get back to normal life and maintain the functional status they're at. So I kind of laugh, but a lot of what we do is education in the ER. Uh, mm-hmm. We're not waving that magic wand. We're kind of level setting patients, you know, based on their exam, here's what we predict, you know, their, their improvements, wh- where they will go from here, the time frame. Uh, can we introduce exercise? Can we introduce uh, basic functioning tasks again? Can we talk about, you know, body mechanics? If we have people who are, you know, coming from work, what kind of work tasks do they do that can we mm-hmm. modify? Uh, and even just sometimes telling what an outpatient provider will do and the importance of that uh, is sometimes a majority of the battle. Uh, I think today we even have a patient that came in via ambulance uh, with low back pain who's in their 30s. So yeah, trying to kind of break down some of those barriers of, you know, pain is uh, incredibly debilitating for that patient, uh, but trying to demonstrate to them ways that they can kind of get back to some sense of normalcy. And safety, so, like that feeling yeah, of safety. It, yeah. And I, I think it's good. We can acknowledge pain. We can acknowledge ways to improve pain, but also not let pain kind of dictate, especially if we know it's not from a dangerous source. Yes. Uh, and I think that's huge because, you know, easy to catastrophize if you can't stand up and this is the first time you ever happened to you, mm-hmm. you know, something inherently must be wrong and must be dangerous. And we have to break that barrier down, which is, you know, not easy. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes requires a lot of teamwork, you know, I think. Yes. A and huge, trust building. Yeah. A huge push for us recently. Well, not recently, but a, a big trend, you know, is avoiding opioids and avoiding other uh, narcotics for pain control. And I think sometimes too, if we're going in to see a patient who's already had some preliminary medications and it's not working, maybe having a conversation too of, of what is this going to take to get this person safely up and moving? Cause uh, an admission for low back pain isn't the greatest either. Uh, and that can big out a lot of other issues mm-hmm. we can avoid would be fantastic. So I always kind of laugh if anybody gets admitted for back pain, even if they have the most perfect examination, full strength, full sensation, no red flags, if they're in the OBS unit and they're here for 24 hours, they're getting an MRI no matter what. (laughs) And that's something that's really a challenge because then you're also fighting what their MRI shows and and what they're presenting with. So, uh, and I think that- And it's funny you say that. I had a patient the other day who actually got an MRI um, for dizziness, which, which we don't do that often, but there were a few concerning factors that like you know, it it was indicated. And I went into the patient's room and I said, Hey, you know, your MRI looks like, how are you feeling? And she said, I feel great. Or she said, I'm sorry. I still feel really dizzy. And I said, Oh, well, your MRI looks great. Everything on your MRI is normal. And she goes, Oh, thank Jesus. I'm cured. (laughs) She she got up and she was ready to go. I was like, yeah, PT complete. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know there's, there's definitely a component to, to, uh, therapeutic diagnostic testing I feel like sometimes think, you no know, yeah we can again talk till we're blue in the face and that can feel good to the patient but if they have such a strong desire uh, it is sometimes hard to break those barriers down so well and I get you know, it people are like well how do you know like how do you know yeah if you don't take if you don't do the imaging how do you know and I was like well you know usually I'm able to demonstrate it well enough with my hands and my education like you know see it's reproducible here like if it wouldn't be that if it was you know in uh, like something scary on your MRI but it is yeah. hard it's hard to talk people into that and you talk about the magic wand I actually finally went and bought a pen with stars on it and now I <laughs> wave it at patients every now and then and they it's usually a good icebreaker you know they'll say do you have a magic wand I say actually I do let's try yeah. that first and it yeah. never works right so then but then they're like at least in a better headspace to participate yeah you know I think too and I I love to introduce what we do and who I am with that knowledge and I think mm-hmm. that that level setting too of the patient immediately uh sets them up to be more apt to work with us but also I think be okay 
with leaving not at that perfect level they thought they might yeah. have mm-hmm. seems kind of silly but like you know telling them if you're at a 10 and we can get you at a six and I can get you walking like that's tremendous and that's going to be you know maybe our goal for today I uh, I think that that helps them kind of frame where they're at uh, I agree and- I also think in the ED like the delta of your change that you see can be tremendous as mm-hmm. opposed to outpatient where it's like this slow change over time, like the Delta in pain or impairment that we can make in, in the ED is huge. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to the, the acuteness of it, of somebody that's never had an issue and things like that, it's, it's also so important to the, you know, let them know there's light at the end of the tunnel and, and what follow-up looks like, I think is, you know, such a key component for us. Uh, We struggle at our institution because we don't have an innate uh, referral source in our same area so we do utilize some of our other uh, partners in care but our downtown region doesn't have outpatient from our our hospital network so it's even sometimes too like how to find a clinic near home and you know talk people through if you have insurance and how to you know call and make sure that things are covered if they're concerned with cost and things like that so you know there are times we have to spend more time to set up an HEP if I know that that person's going to have zero Mm -hmm. outpatient I might have to do a little bit more work to kind of progress them through, which, you know, is incredibly time consuming. But uh, I think to us doing our due diligence, if we just know for certain that that patient's not going to have any other really opportunity to do that with any other provider. Yeah, especially if they're uninsured or underinsured or like have the kind of job where it really will not allow them to go to physical therapy. We actually, I think as a profession, put a lot of barriers in patients' ways sometimes, which is not ideal. Um, I got a question from somebody this week, or I guess it was more of a comment. They say they, yeah. they're working at a hospital in a different state and they're trying to build an ED to PT track for back pain, but it's been really challenging and they've been met with a lot of resistance. So because this is kind of an area where you specialize and you're doing research, like what are some key things that you would say to that person to help them like push through the, some of those barriers that they're having? Yeah. Did it seem to kind of more from like a referral or like yeah. an order? It yeah. seems more like an administrative situation or like yeah. a culture change. Yeah, no doubt. And I think one of our biggest benefits uh, being downstairs was uh, we have a, a large ED uh, emergency medicine residency program. And one of the biggest things that we kind of got our, our foot in the door was, is introductions, uh, right when those uh, post-grad year one interns are coming in to kind of talk about what we do, but also tying into their second and third years, uh, doing education on what does it look like for us to do a a low back examination and actually involving the residents hands-on with us. So we would uh, historically do like a half day on Fridays in the mornings where I would have just a single uh, resident doing their kind of orthopedic sports med rotation Mm -hmm. or just shadowing us so ideally we're going to see back pain and other msk issues but we were really able to kind of show what we can do uh and demonstrate kind of the successes that we've had uh and for them then they know like every time i've got a patient that comes in that's going to be somewhat challenging hey guess what we've got this you know fantastic resource here that can help you uh and i think that was a, a huge avenue uh I think to, you know, just even sometimes proving <laughs> that you can get somebody out that might be a challenge, mm-hmm. you know, some, like, oh, we're going to bring this person no matter what, there's no way you can get them out. You know, there are obviously times where we've also unsuccessful, but uh, having those little one-time successes with those patients can really open the eyes for an attending and things like that, where uh, they're much more apt. And even too, like through other, other means, our, our vestibular care, our geriatric care, uh, you know, we get jokingly called, you know, the wizard that can come in sometimes and like solve these problems. Yes. But the fixer. Yeah. And I think too, like a, a good entry person into the EDPT realm needs to take on challenges and be okay with not winning every battle. But those, those ones that you do win are also so key to the team that they mm-hmm. do not. I mean, I, I still get 
times where, you know, you'll hear an attending introduce you to like maybe a, a med student that's there for the day and, you know, talking about previous cases that we've helped out with. And so they, they recognize uh, our strengths and, and what we can do. And that is a really good way uh, to kind of get those referrals. Uh, persistence is key. I mean, I would be commonly looking through our track board and, you know, Hey, this person's here for this. Can I see them? Well, mm -hmm. you know, well, guess what? I'm going to go see them now. Okay. That's fine. So, you know, persistence in the face of adversity, adversity, uh, it, it's okay to be told you don't need to really see them, but if you ask kindly enough, a lot of times you're like, you know what, go ahead, go see them. Uh, and I think too, that clinician will usually come back, go through their discharge paperwork, and they'll usually hear a positive comment from the patient of how beneficial that was. And that kind of also yes. feeds a nice little win for us in that category. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had this discussion with people like, do we need to see all of these people? Maybe not, but yeah. are we adding upstream value to their care? I, I 100% think we are. If we can keep people from coming back to the emergency department, if we can prevent a fall going forward, if we can help them move more safely and confidently, all of those things are good. Or if we just give them the peace of mind knowing that they're going to be okay when they leave, even if all I did was adjust their crutches or, or tell them, you know, these are some things that I would look out for when you go home. I, I think that's a value add. Yeah, most definitely. And I think to somebody starting a new program, like that's a good way also to get more confidence in what you're doing. You know, we have so many people that come in with like an ankle sprain, right? That's straightforward. The team doesn't need us to see that person to have them leave, but uh, holy cow, the, the amount of training that you can do in a short period of time, talking through an HEP, you know, talking through price, you, you know, like you said, adjusting crutches, going through stair training, that eases that patient's anxiety tremendously mm -hmm. and is such a value add again, it's, it's a tough sell in some regards when we're like slam packed and busy, like, can I use this half an hour? But, uh, there are a lot of other reasons too, why our beds are held up. And if there are times where you're like searching for patients, that's like the perfect Avenue just to, to stay busy. Uh, sometimes appease your manager if they're really concerned about productivity standards and things like that. Uh, we're lucky enough now that, you know, we try to think about productivity, not necessarily in units, uh, but based in other regards uh, in terms of safe discharge planning mm -hmm. and things like that, where, yeah, your, your value can sometimes be talking to somebody for 10 minutes and just going through an HEP and maybe not doing a, a, a massive evaluation and treatment and all that. Uh, but that just comes from, you know, becoming more comfortable in how to take those cases and, you know, you know, having maybe 15 minutes to go see somebody quick and do that can be really helpful. I also think you're freeing up somebody else's hands. So yeah. if, if you're the one doing the crutch fitting or the compression wrapping or the education, like that, that allows somebody with a different skill set to go help somebody else. And that mm -hmm. helps alleviate that bedlock a little bit as well. Because in, in our hospital, like the paramedics or the EMTs will often do that, like crutch fitting or splinting. Mm -hmm. But they have other other skills that they could be using doing other things that I cannot do. Like I can't place an IV. I can't take one out. Like there, there yeah. are things their hands should be doing that my hands cannot. So if we can distribute the needs of the patient a little bit more effectively, I think that's the way to go. Yeah. And that's, that's a great point. You know, we've talked to some of our directors or medical directors too, that, you know, we're still recovering from a massive nurses shortage where we're having mm -hmm. a ton of travel nurses who are, you know, only here for a very short period of time. And same thing, we're kind of a familiar face and we can definitely allow those providers to have more time to do other things. You know, we're not seeing anybody that's, you know, in such a medical crisis that, you know, those patients are taking up a ton of time from other staff where we can kind of focus on, you know, maybe people who are just waiting for an inpatient bed, uh, but have needs. Uh, where, where likewise, there's a huge customer service aspect as well as a, a help to the team just to alleviate some of those other stressors. So uh, I, I think we know enough about healthcare 
and the stress that it provides to patients that some people would say like that customer service aspect shouldn't matter in healthcare. But I think we've learned enough about like the psychological aspects of receiving care that when you are more satisfied with your care, that experience is less traumatic and your healing tends to be better, right? Like when you're confident in the care you received, if you're satisfied, if you feel like all of your needs were addressed, I think you, you recover more effectively. Yeah. Yeah. And some of our preliminary work with our low back pain study too, we had, you know, callbacks and focus groups. And I think we got a lot of that positive feedback where it was just, you know, somebody was here, they were with me for more than just two minutes. They Mm -hmm. were actively listening. They were, you know, validating my concerns. They were coming up with a plan, which I think a lot of times might not exist in some of our standards discharges where it's like, you know, nothing was fractured you're safe to go home, follow wow. up with your primary care, where we're mm-hmm. actually kind of like establishing a patient focused plan besides just going to a follow up, which they might not really even understand too. Well, why am I seeing another doctor if you guys didn't, you know, figure out what's going on? So I think that's a, a really positive uh, aspect that we have, you know, and I think that's another benefit of having a a large acute care background of knowing kind of how things work in the hospital. Mm -hmm. It helps out so much to help educate that patient on, you know, if you come in with this diagnosis, here's what to expect. And uh, being that provider that can also perform some of those, those duties. I think that's a great point. One of my favorite patient satisfaction questionnaire comments ever that I I (laughs) tried never to forget was the PT made me feel like a person. I felt like a human while I was here. Yeah. And so I, I try to remember that one every day. All right. I've got an awkward question for you because I always yeah. ask everybody what they love yeah. about their job, but I want to know what you hate about it. I never ask anybody this. And I really want to know, like, what is the worst part? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the, the worst part is there are times where I, don't know, I, f- I feel like we always want to provide the patient something. And there are times, whether it's based on psychosocial issues or sometimes just the unknown that our hands are kind of tied. And Mm. you can see that with the patient uh, just wanting to know something, whether it's, you know, is there truly something going on? Uh, Can you provide me anything where we also kind of, you know, run into roadblocks. And I, I see this a lot with our vestibular patients where their MRI is negative. All of our testing bedsides negative, but they're still symptomatic and we can kind of, you know, there are a lot of diagnoses of exclusion that this still could be, but you can kind of see it on their face and in their person where it's kind of deflating. And when we have one visit in a short period of time, it's, it's really hard to kind of do all those things I talked about earlier, like level setting and planning when there's still so much on the unknown. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think that's the, the part of the job I think is the hardest is we have the one time to make an impact and sometimes uh we're also kind of handcuffed on what we can do as well as that kind of outpatient follow-up like i don't want to see you again for the same reason tomorrow to come back here but i also don't know where you might best have that care and i think that's challenging too and physicians feel the same way uh and we have that as well, but I think that's always a challenge from the, the ER is, you know, we can't have all the answers. And I think growing up, you know, thinking about how a hospital and physicians work, you know, somebody has to have the answer somewhere down the road, right? Mm-hmm. And that ambiguity is always tough. Granted, of doing this close to 10 years now, I'm, I'm much better at how I frame that to patients uh, and kind of talking through uh, at least all the positives of things that we've ruled out, which I think is helpful. Uh, but sometimes you can just see the distress of kind of still being back at square one and, and not knowing where to go has got to be a, a terrible feeling. Yeah. Especially when people have that sense that the emergency room is where they'll get answers. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, just a second opinion or things like that. You know, and there are cases we see lots of, really troubling and tough things as well, which uh, I wish didn't have to happen. But Mm -hmm. again, trying to make the best of all those situations too is, you know, treating people like patients first 
And even in the toughest situations, I think, like you said, bring some humanity to those situations. And even if it's just spending more time to get to know that person before you do anything is so helpful just to f- have them feel like a person instead of just somebody occupying a bed. Yeah. Just the next in line. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for the case? Yeah. Yeah. I've got a case in mind. All right. Lay it on me. So uh, I don't know the exact age, but I think is it a female in the early forties uh, came in with an acute set, diz- acute onset dizziness, uh, not positionally provoked by any means uh, initially, uh, but sustained. So not never feeling like the dizziness completely went away. Uh, it was actually seen by a medical student first. Uh, we got the page later in the day to come down and see. They're like, we see some nystagmus. We definitely think she's got uh, BPPV. So I had a chance to kind of do a brief chart review. Uh, nothing really in the chart that was concerning uh, at all in terms of any prior medical history. Uh, talked to the medical student. The attending had not seen yet, but was going to see after we went in. Uh, and so they had not performed a Dix Hall Pike. They had not performed any uh, positional testing. Uh, I think they were basing it on kind of the the description of symptoms with the rim spinning mm-hmm. dizziness. Uh, that was what was going on. Uh, and so I was able to go and see the patient. And I, I first noticed some kind of resting spontaneous nystagmus. It wasn't like jumping off, off the page at me. You know, sometimes we see like a neuritis where it's just kind of like, oh yeah, this is pretty obviously like right into my hints exam. Uh, but the nystagmus is slightly atypical kind of uh, crescendoing. It would be, you know, slight high intensity that would kind of decrease to nothing. Uh, so I kind of did some just other brief neuro stuff at bedside. All, you know, dysmetric testing was fine. Rapid alternating movement was fine. Sensation was fine. Strength was great. Uh, so I'm like, all right, let's get up and take a look at some, some gait and whatnot. So, uh, Romberg was actually okay. Uh, no problem. And, uh, where I first noticed the big concern was kind of like gait. So gait was a little bit wonky, kind of short shuffling steps, not truly a toxic, but, uh, definitely something that was concerning to me. So the team wanted me to do an Epley maneuver and help discharge the patient home, uh, but I don't know if I've given you too much already. I probably have, but I don't know. It doesn't sound like the Epley was super warranted in this case. That would be correct. I, I was not really concerned. Uh, the more I asked subjective questions, it sounded like the dizziness again was persistent, uh, not really episodic in nature, even though I think the, the one education I give all people doing vestibular exam is if if the dizziness is worse with movement, that doesn't mean it's set off by movement. So trying to yes. hone in on uh, what kind of her symptoms were. So even though it was worse with moving, it was still present at rest. And seeing the resting nystagmus was obviously concerning as well. Uh, so and I kind of went. Was down it that. horizontal nystagmus? Like what? What? Yeah. What kind of nystagmus were you seeing? Yeah. So it was it was horizontal, uh, but it wasn't really following any pattern in terms of Mm. uh unilateral and kind of like i said the the on and off uh of it in terms of intensity uh was a little bit odd and so i did end up doing a hints exam at bedside and uh both head and pulse tests were fine so i again immediately kind of think okay well nystagmus but both VOR intact and concerned about a central cause, even though this person right. is really young. What was uh, her like description of onset? So she was a teacher and I think uh, she actually had a headache first mm. uh, and then developed this dizziness. And then the dizziness kind of became more prevalent uh, than the headache itself. Uh, it almost was somewhat described as like a, almost like an ocular migraine. There it wasn't necessarily a, a severe aura, but she did have like light sensitivity. And I think sometimes we see with any type of nystagmus, people just have a, a tough time tolerating that. And sometimes can, you know, feels better with my eyes closed, light bothers it, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I was definitely concerned with 
the kind of atypical nystagmus, the, the hip being intact bilaterally, skew was fine. But with the gait and all those things too, I talked to the team. Sounds like and, a head CT to me. Yeah, yeah. So I actually talked to them. I, and I was like, you know, I think there's something central going on here. I, I said, if, if the CTs are normal, I would still be somewhat concerned for an MRI just based on the gait alone. Uh, we've definitely had cases where we've had CTs that come back fine and have MRI findings. So yeah. her CTs were fine. Uh, but the MRI actually showed a, a small pontine hypoperfusion. Mm. Uh, so she was uh, seen by our neurologist. Uh, they took her to our neuro step down unit. She actually started to feel better quite quickly. Uh, they did kind of the full stroke workup and they anticipated that this was actually caused by uh, her oral contraceptives, possibly having a, a small stroke with that. So that is a really good thing to bring up because I think yeah. we overlook that a lot. And and the beginning of my career, I worked in spinal cord and traumatic brain injury <laughs> almost exclusively. Yeah. And then the number of patients that I saw who were even younger in their twenties and thirties, who'd had yeah. acquired brain injuries from contraceptive use. So I think it's when you're receiving that history from a patient and taking a look at like what medications they take, I think that should be part of your differential, especially when you have somebody who's in their forties, like you're, I mean, yeah. that could be me. Like the patient that you're describing could be me. Cause I'm 41. I mean, that could happen to me. So I think you raise a really good point with that. That's really good information. Yeah. And that, that's something too. It's one of those cases now where you're like always thinking about, uh, you know, a female of that age that, you know, something to ask, especially if you're thinking about central causes, mm -hmm. you know, then of super prevalent to me, if she had a, you know, a positive Dix Hall bike and it's straight for BPV, no, it's not mm -hmm. something we have to go down that, that route. But, you know, I always for vestibular patients will do a thorough neuro exam because again, we've seen enough stuff like this where you know it seems straightforward the team tells you just come do an epley and why why we have a doctoring profession is because we're going to do our exactly. full examination and come to our own conclusions and ideally it's consistent right, right. Uh, but i think to working in the er the, the teams acknowledge too everybody has areas that are not their specialty and I think too it's like if I plop down and they're like oh yeah Kyle go and see this person you know I don't know just with some new uh oncology diagnosis I would have no idea what to do and I yeah. think that's the, for us the ED physician has to be a good quarterback and figure out who to consult is sometimes as important of what intervention to provide so I think that's given me a, a ton of respect for ER physicians, just how difficult their job is, because you can have somebody come in with a, a vastly different complaint, you know, 14 times in one day and try to figure out uh, the, the knowledge of medicine has to be so broad. Uh, it's just so challenging. And I think we do see a large variety of patients, but again, we kind of have our own little wheelhouses for what stuff that we're really good at. And there's things that you know, we also need to improve upon. Uh, and that's a good way to kind of, you know, frame what CEUs you want to take and, and where to kind of stress uh, education to, to make your weaknesses more strengths. Absolutely. And the point you're making so beautifully is that PT in the emergency department is truly top of scope, just like mm -hmm. those physicians. Like we have to be able to autonomously kind of make our own decisions and diagnoses because this is not a, this is not the type of practice where you're filling orders. This is not a technician service. You have to be at the top of that doctoring profession. Yeah. And I think that for a new clinician is challenging. I know there's been good talk and specialization. And I think really like if you are not confident in your skills and you're going to have to go talk to a, a attending provider and, and tell them I disagree, <laughs> you better be you ready. know, better be ready. Mm -hmm. yeah, you got to know what you're saying. You got to know what you're doing and really know the risks for, for all things. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of 
are there predominantly for helping discharge and expediting that service. But we do so much more than that, that I think that gets glossed over. Uh, that's kind of our way to get in to the ER is helping some of those things, but really our benefit is to the patient in terms of the specialty care that they can get that they wouldn't otherwise. I 100% agree. Kyle, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, if you have, if we, if somebody has more questions for you, how can they reach you? Yeah. Uh, you can reach me by email. It's probably the easiest. Uh, my email at work is just kyle.strickland at nm.org. Uh, and that's an easy way to, to reach out. Uh, usually checking that pretty frequently and more than happy to get back to anybody that has any questions. Perfect. Thank you so much. And this has been another episode of Admitted or Not, the podcast exclusively for emergency department physical therapists. If you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe. And also just to let you know, we do have some new continuing education opportunities for you on our website. So we have some recorded webinars, the eddpt.com slash continuing education. And we will be having a two-day course in Madison, Wisconsin in January on how to build a thriving emergency department physical therapist practice. And as always, we thank you for being with us today.